All right. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon to some of you. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Trevor Hall. Uh, I'm the uh, founder and, um, and the head guy for Clear Creek Digital. Uh, we're a communications and marketing agency really devoted to providing those services uh, to the mining industry on the global scale. So I did want to welcome you today uh, to our webinar uh, titled Communicating Through a Mining Crisis, Tips on How to Use Social Media. A um, couple of housekeeping things uh, before we get started. There is a chat function uh, within the uh, webinar software here that if you have any questions for either myself or Dan along the way, please be sure to uh, type those questions into the chat box, or if you're having any issues whatsoever, uh, any technical stuff uh, that we're not catching on our end, please be sure to mention that as well. Um, so uh, today as we, we have got a great presentation from a gentleman who seems to be very popular in the world of mining and online communication. So uh, I followed Dan for, uh, for many months here and I'm always delighted and see a lot of value with what he shares online, especially with the social media networks. I know he's very popular on LinkedIn and lots of engagement. So I'm happy that I could partner with him to offer this uh, presentation today. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, here's a brief history. Um, some of you are very much aware of what we're doing here at Clear Creek Digital um, and why we created it. But in case if you are new to our organization and our webinars, uh, here's a brief rundown of what makes us unique and different to other communication firms around the globe. Uh, here's a couple of things we do well, and if you've been a part of our webinars in the last few months, uh, I have reformatted this slide, and really what I wanted to do was share, um, you know, we can do a wide range of things. Digital communications and digital marketing are very vast, um, but here are the, some of the things that we think we do really, really well, especially for where we want to position ourselves within the mining industry. Uh, social media, obviously, that's our huge player. Our goal is to really partner with mining companies so we can tell their story through the online dialogue that the market is demanding people play in this day. That's the sandbox we live in. But we also incorporate video and other visual media into creating those effective uh, storytelling strategies. Uh, we do online sentiment analysis. So there is some programs and algorithms that we can run uh, data through to see what is the public sentiment of the online uh, dialogue and communications that are, that are representing your brand and your industry and your company. Uh, and that also plays in with the data and analytic, analytics. So we are able to really judge to see what kind of communication is most effective, what can we tweak and make better, what's definitely not working, um, you know, and really we want to see that data uh, prove our stories are really engaging in, in changing the way we are uh, telling the stories. Um, I did have a couple uh, updates uh, that I did want to share with you that I'm really uh, excited about. Um, one, uh, if you're not uh, following our blog called The Digital Dredge, which is on our website at clearcreekdigital.com, uh, I did attend the Mine Expo for only one day. Uh, it was the first day. Sorry, I had to get back uh, for some family matters uh, Tuesday afternoon. Um, but from that, we did a couple. We did a couple different things. Um, uh, I wanted to be there for two reasons. First, I wanted to do some networking and find some really innovating and awesome stuff the industry was uh, working on and creating, and that maybe that's uh, available or coming down the market soon. Uh, that was one thing I want to do. Second, I really wanted to do a simple case study with our own social media networks to see what the visuals of the event could do for our engagement. I hope you take a moment to read that uh, blog that if you have if you haven't already. In summary, here's a few bullet points we found. Uh, we gained 118% increased engagement with Twitter that day, and 273% increased engagement uh, just on our Instagram. So the power of the visual content and the storytelling really can be backed up by some of the basic KPIs uh, when it comes to your communication strategy. And this is just a real brief example of how you can do it. 
Uh, please feel free to use this for any sort of support you might need uh, to have some social media strategies approved within your organization. Um, here's just a, some quick photos. Uh, on the left, you see uh, me and uh, my uh, good friend and mining mentor, Hugh Miller, from Colorado School of Mines. So you'll meet up with him. And then um, on the right, that was, if you were at the uh, Mine Expo, that's the 400-ton lever haul truck that they had in the convention center. And that image alone um, really people were really engaged with when I posted on my social media, so I wanted to share that as well. Uh, a couple more updates. Um, uh, we received confirmation last week that we've been approved to present at the SME annual conference in February. That event will take place in Denver, so I'll be presenting uh, topic mining's digital communications, utilizing web tools and data for enhanced value. So if you happen to be at SME this year, please drop by and say hello. We will be discussing online sentiment value, being mobile responsive, social listening, and of course, online data analytics to add value to your organization. Um, in, included in the SME conference is a really great um, uh, competition that MSC, uh, SME has uh, launched. It's called the Move Mining Competition. Uh, so I'm happy to share with you that SME has created uh, this team competition this year to help develop strategies to improve upon the reputation of the industry. They are calling it Move Mining, and I have been asked to be a panelist and judge for the final team. Uh, really honored to be asked. Uh, I would encourage you to take a, take a look at the website at www.movemining.org and learn a little bit more. Um, there is a cash award. Uh, and uh, perhaps you would like to put together a team to compete or know some of your colleagues who would be interested. Uh, if you have any questions about uh, the Move Mining Competition, uh, reach out to me and I'll be happy to get you in touch with the right people. Um, and then one slide that I didn't put in there but I wanted to briefly mention, we are days if not hours away uh, from launching uh, reclamationcolorado.com. And this is a really great website that we've been working on with the state of Colorado uh, here in Denver. It's going to be a website strictly focused on reclamation projects and processes for the mining industry in the state of Colorado. Uh, so I will be sending out a notification through my contacts once that is launched. Uh, this will be, from, from what I know, the only website uh, in the United States strictly devoted to reclamation efforts in one state. Uh, so other states out there, you know, that has a real uh, dynamic mining industry, you know, Utah, Nevada, Arizona. Um, I hope to take a look at it and uh, kind of come up with some ideas of what you might be able to do to tell your reclamation story as well. Okay, so enough of that. I will move on to the webinar topic, communicating through a mining crisis, tips on how to use social media. Um, so why are we addressing this topic today? Uh, and this is some stats that I took directly from M. Shaw's statistics. The safety gains in metal and non-metal mining have obviously been very impressive over the last 100 years. In the 1930s, an average of 233 miners died per year in the non-coal mining sector compared to an average of 24 fatalities per year from 2006 to 2010. 2009, mining fatalities in the sector reached a then record low of 17, and 2010 uh, saw 23 metal non-metal miners killed in accidents. Uh, we reached record low fatalities of 16 in 2011 and 2012, showing that there are continuing gains uh, within mine safety, and I don't think um, that comes as surprise to any of us, and we're very proud of those numbers, and we, can, we only want to improve, obviously. Um, but as we know, uh, accidents do happen, and they happen suddenly. So here's just a couple headlines that I had pulled recently. Um, uh, 22 miners freed in Nicaragua as rescue efforts continue. Another one from last year, 17 workers in New York rescued from the salt mine. Um, and for those of you who have uh, participated in webinars before with me, uh, you know I use the Samarco Dam disaster in Brazil quite often as an example. Um, uh, it's really an interesting um, place for me to really 
show the value in using so social media, especially when it comes to crisis communication. So um, I'm sure we're all aware of what happened at the San Marco Dam in Brazil. Uh, there were um, an incident that was described as the worst environmental disaster in Brazil's history, and 17 people were killed. It was speculated that the causes of the collapse would be some weakness, were some weaknesses to the dam structure. Um, but beyond the headlines, let's take a look at a few things. This was a sentiment analysis that I pulled one week after the San Marco Dam collapse and using BHP Billiton, who um, owned half of that project, uh, is a joint venture of Valet. But I just did a sentiment analysis for BHP Billiton. If you look at the day before, uh, their sentiment analysis was at 52, I believe. Pretty good, uh, pretty good sentiment score online. That means half of what people were talking about you were very positive, and half of what people were talking about you were very negative. And I think that's basically the world mining really lives in. Uh, obviously, Clear Creek Digital would like to move that average to be more positive, but after that disaster, that sentiment score really dropped uh, to 10. So it was uh, it was not good. Um, and we saw the, the online communications and dialogue really hinder the reputation and the brand of BHP Billiton. And then we take a look at BHP's, uh, I just pulled excerpts from the Twitter feed uh, during that time. Um, you know, the content shared on Twitter that then was not formatted to optimize the user experience of the network. Um, if you joined us uh, last month, uh, uh, Tyson Anzel of uh, Resolution Copper really noted how each network represents a different style of communication to a different group of people. Um, and from what we see here, BHP's response on Twitter, it really wasn't, um, they weren't using the network as best as it could. It was a misstep here, I believe, and I don't know if they had social media engagement in the crisis communication strategy, but by the looks of it, they probably did not. Um, as we should all be aware of Twitter, you want to get to the information quick in 140 characters and be done. Um, most people are not going to want to click on your link and they're not going to want to read um, the entire uh, article that you've posted about it. They really missed a step here to get uh, really precise communication and engagement and information out the door. So this is a little something I wrote in the age of online. Uh, to not have a plan for social media in your crisis communication strategy might be the biggest risk you can take in an already risky business. So with that, I do want to introduce uh, Dan uh, Blondo here. Uh, I'm pretty sure many of you know Dan. I sure hope you do. Um, it's trying to turn Dan's audio on. Uh, a little intro about Dan. Uh, Dan is a communications and media relations professional from Marquette, Michigan. He graduated from Northern Michigan University. For more than a decade, he's designed and implemented communication strategies to help businesses tell their story. He was a part of the team that developed the Eagle Mine in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. An Eagle Mine is a small, high grade nickel and copper underground mine that commenced operations in 2014 after more than a decade of permitting. His unique ability to listen and translate complex topics into plain English helped transform the community's interaction with the mind from a combative one to a collaborative one. So Dan, welcome and thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks Trevor. Um, happy uh, to be on the webinar today. Um, can you hear me all right? I can, thank you. Well, uh, Trevor's going to be kind enough this afternoon to drive my, my presentation for me. I'm just a little more background. You see the full screen here, Dan. Yep. OK, great. So just, a little, just real quick other background on, on Eagle. So Eagle is a, or a small, high-grade nickel copper mine, as, as Trevor mentioned. Um, for much of Eagle's permitting life of 10 years, um, communications, uh, particularly anything with, with digital, was, was really not taking place. So um, 
once we really started ramping those efforts up in 2011, 2012, we had nearly a decade of um, no voice out there, whether it's in, it was in the community or in a digital space um, for a positive message for the project. So we had a lot of work to do um, to get us where we needed to be. So uh, Trevor, if you just wanna move forward on the next one. So I found this a very interesting quote. Um, Today, uh, it's, it's, it should be a no-brainer, but a lot of times um, integrating social media um, is not always thought of um, in our crisis communications plan. And, and Trevor, I touched on those earlier that it really needs to be built in from the beginning. Um, so I thought this, this quote from Christine really hits, it, hits the nail on the head. Um, there, there really is no, no space, no reason um, in this day and age, as you guys probably all know, um, not to be, to be planning. And, um, you know, a lot of those plans with many mining companies that have been around for a long time are not in place yet. And that's something that we, we have to get the ball rolling on and moving. And a lot of times that means getting support from, from top management. We can move on to the next one. So planning, not optional, um, very important. Um, Many of you probably have crisis communications plans, hopefully, and communications is often built into that component um, somehow. Um, the, the plans that we had originally at Eagle, um, Eagle was, or, or I'm sorry, is owned by Lundin Mining Corporation now. Uh, prior it was with Rio Tinto. Going from Rio Tinto to Lundin, um, Lundin didn't have a lot of the crisis comms uh, planning in place. Rio did, but it was still at that time a little lacking on I would say both the internal and external comms and really uh, none of the social component was there. So we, we kind of built that from the ground up. Um, one of the things that we also did is started to include um, crisis comms in our drills. Um, originally we started doing mock simulations for uh, disasters at the mine. Um, communications went as far as having the HR manager be the comms contact and it was pretty much just statements uh, to family every 24 hours. Um, obviously, in this day and age, that's, that's not going to work. So we had to build in um, the different components to our plan. And then that wasn't enough. We actually had to put that into our mock simulations. So um, what we started out with is doing just a, a canvas of the community, seeing what networks they use, um, um, what platforms are the best and, and also um, the right ways to communicate. Um, the other thing we had to think of, um, and I'll touch a little, a little bit more on later, is having backups and to think about other scenarios such as internet connection, um, time of day, uh, just different planning when, when people may not be um, available. So um, there's a lot of great examples online if you don't have a crisis come. Uh, plan in place, or if yours is missing the, the social media component, a robust comms component, um, there's definitely a lot of great examples out there to, to utilize. Thank you. Forward. Just touching base quickly on what I said again, know your audience, know your community. Um, we had a, a really great uh, president um, at Eagle who was a huge Twitter user. Um, and was very, very supportive of our messages um, through Twitter, not so much LinkedIn or Facebook. And what we, what we ended up doing is pulling the analytics, uh, providing them information to show that in a small rural town in Upper Michigan, um, there's really no Twitter users. Um, it, it really wasn't a, a way for us to get out our message. Um, the way to get out our message really was um, Facebook, demographic-wise, usage-wise. Um, again, though, we are, we are way behind the eight ball. Um, there were multiple opposition sites for years. Um, we didn't have a voice. So in 20, early 2014, we started building that voice through Facebook online. Um, there was a lot of hesitation at first um, from um, management, uh, fearful of negativity uh, and just opposition over running our page. And to be quite honest, at the beginning, it was not easy. Um, and it was a huge time commitment uh, for myself. Uh, but slowly, surely, um, as we, we created a dialogue, um, uh, started telling our story um, and really using more of a plain English format. So we weren't using your press release uh, type of speak. We weren't doing anything real technical. We were bringing everything down to um, common speak and, and um, 
just standard everyday language. So we started building our following. Um, it started slow. It started to take off. And over the course of a year, uh, we gained a lot of a lot of momentum. We have a lot of good dialogue, um, opposition supporters alike. Um, and one of the most interesting things was as we continued to utilize the page, we were having to defend ourselves less and less and less with opposition comments. So our supporters, our employees, people in the community that were, were rooting for the mine were actually taking um, the commenting um, away from us and commenting on, on, on whether it was safety or environmental protection or whatever it might be related to the mine. They were combating some of the negative stuff that we were seeing. Um, and, and we would interject when, when we, we had to, but uh, the, the dialogue continued where, like I said, we were, we were really not having to defend the mine. The community was really stepping up and, and our employees too to um, support us. You would go to the next one. So why, why I say uh, a lot of that is that you can't build a relationship in a time of crisis. You can't build trust in a time of crisis. So by the, the, the picture that you're seeing here is a, um, a truck that had rolled over in the middle of the night. It was going from the Eagle Mine to the Humboldt Mill, and it was hauling roughly 100,000 pounds of ore. Um, the road it's, uh, is a two-lane road. Um, you can see trees on one side. On the other side, there is a cliff that goes down to Lake Superior. So it's a narrow stretch. It's remote. There's barely a cell signal. Um, and I got a call at about 3 a.m. that this truck had tipped over. I lived about 20 minutes away. Um, I grabbed my, my um, crisis communication packet, all my gear, and I headed out to the, the site. By that time, a local uh, TV station that um, was very much publicly against the mine was already there, was already filming, was already tweeting. So um, we had a Facebook, Twitter uh, campaign going on um, essentially right when I got there. Um, the photo on the left was at three in the morning. The photo on the right, uh, we do have a, we had a, a drone at the mine, so we were able to get a better perspective of the site once it became daylight. Um, we constantly posted updates. Uh, we did it every hour, which means I, I had to drive about 10 miles to get a signal, um, come back to the site. So there was a lot of, uh, of in and out. With our planning, what we missed with this situation is that I was the, my boss was uh, lead comms person, so mainly press release, um, you know, going over messages, talking up for management, and I was to handle media, uh, social media, internal comms, external comms, uh, dialogue between departments, etc., and had no other backup. So I was on site for about 18 hours, going back and forth to signal. So there was a lot of things that we did right. There was definitely things that we learned from this situation. So we should have had more backup from from other individuals that I could have maybe texted or called for posting. Um, we could have uh, worked through this scenario in our, our mitigation, or I'm sorry, our crisis planning drills a little better. Um, but overall, um, if you would go to the next slide. Overall, what we ended up having is a very good response. So again, we were providing information, but our employees and, and supporters in the community were really doing a lot of the replies or comments or giving us kudos. So, so throughout this entire um, uh, situation, which was in, in, in December, middle of December, it was cold, it was snowy, um, it was a, a holiday weekend. There was a lot of holiday parties going around around town. Um, we, we constantly kept this up to date about every hour or so. Even if we didn't have information, new information to share, we were still communicating with folks um, and trying to be as, as transparent and open as possible. Um, and we, we received a lot of kudos uh, locally for that. Luckily in this situation, um, no one was hurt. Um, uh, and the material, uh, the, the high grade ore that was spilled on the ground, there was roughly a thousand pounds of ore that was spilled out, was contained. Um, cleaned up uh, and taken care of. So out of 100,000 pounds of ore, um, there could have been a lot of other, other uh, scenarios for this incident that could have went horribly wrong. Uh, but we, we really lucked out from a safety standpoint, environmental standpoint, and that has a lot to say too about Eagle and, and just the way they operate. So we know accidents are gonna happen. We know there's gonna be crisis, but we need to be prepared and planned um, ahead of time. So just to close out, uh, I know we're wrapping up in time, but um, just 
just different tips, things not to forget. So do make your plan ahead of time and, and, and exercise that plan. Even if your company doesn't have a, um, a drill or a mock exercise, you know, maybe once, twice a year, I would still, um, I'm sorry, there's a comment I'll, uh, that I'll, or a question I'll get to. Um, even if there's not a plan, practice your messages. Think about it. Think about your, your, your plan of action if there was to be an event. Um, have key messages set aside. Um, don't hesitate to bring other people in as well. Um, when you're when you're in a crisis mode, you tend to get a little too focused and, and forget to ask for help. I was on site for 18 hours uh, straight. I could have easily asked for a, a team member to, to help me out or get more support on the ground. Um, look at other best practices. Uh, Trevor has a lot of great uh, posts on LinkedIn, on the blog. Uh, great examples to learn from what not to do, what to do. Um, I think that's that's uh, a lot of helpful material as well. Uh, and then building that trust uh, beforehand, which I'll, I just have to emphasize again, because you can't build it during uh, a crisis. Um, what, prior to us having a Facebook page, one of our managers said, "Well, we could just launch one when we have it when when something happens," and and that was, you know, definitely something we didn't follow through with or or um, uh, listen to. But you cannot you cannot form that uh, in the time of crisis. You have to build a relationship. You have to build trust. And also guidelines. So have guidelines for your, your social media page if you don't already um, about negative comments, uh, profanity, all of those things. Have that on your page so people know from the get-go um, what's there. So how do, how do you control negative comments? Um, really, you don't. So um, we, we let people vent. We let people talk. Um, we had a guidelines for the page, unless unless someone was using profanity, um, or, or uh, blasting with uh, you know a million different posts about all these different things, um, we didn't we didn't take any comments off of our page uh, unless they fell outside of the guidelines. Um, we would typically respond to, to negative comments. Uh, we would we really bridge and talk to the uh, either um, debunk the the negative claim or, or provide positive information. Um, but not attack the individual and not get into a back and forth with the individual. So one comment to a negative response is good. And then after that, we would just let, um, you know, let it go from there, whether, whether the person uh, would keep posting or other people come into the conversation. But we, we tended not to take down any post uh, and, and really just let the dialogue um, be there. So I know that's really, really, really quick, um, but I'd be happy anytime uh, to, to speak with anyone, LinkedIn, um, by email, whatever it might be on, on some more of this stuff. And there's obviously a lot more that went into to Eagle's strategy and, and has sense um, uh, that I, I'd be happy to share or, or brainstorm with anyone. Thanks, Dan. Um, yeah, so now is a great time to type in some questions uh, for Dan and myself uh, in that chat box. But Dan, I did have um, one question that was that you know that I had kind of formulated in, in your presentation with the new um, applications of video, uh, whether it be live video or just recorded video within uh, Facebook and Instagram. And even like the stories you can now do in Instagram, do you see there is a place for that within a crisis communication strategy as well? I think there is definitely. Um, one of the things that, that we had talked about when I was at Eagle is you know everyone has a cell phone, all the operators have iPhones. Um, what we built into our our internal policy is that during a time of crisis, you know there there is none of that. So I, I think there is a place for sure. And, and I, I would never not uh, say, you know, don't be transparent, don't be open, but, you know, there's definitely situations where you might not want, you know, we might not have all the information, we might not want Facebook Live for um, a mind fire, a mind collapse. So I think there's definitely a place, but it has to be well thought out and, and managed during the crisis. Sure. And, and in that one example that you gave us of, with the uh, overturned truck, um, did you see more traffic to your social media pages during that time than, you know, any, you know, normal business days? 
Oh yeah, it was unbelievable. And and I I would uh, the monthly management report I would share all the all of our online data with our management team. And I mean the spike that we had for about a 36 hour period was more traffic than we had seen in probably six months. I mean it was huge. Um, and the, the sharing and the comments and everything with that. I mean it was amazing. Um, and then when you really drill down to it and kind of you know. Your, the the perception positive negative for all of that I mean, is overwhelmingly um, positive. Um, looks like John asked a question below. In your 18 hours on media duty, did you get caught in an off-camera hot mic situation that you regret what you said? No, 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 I did not. But we had several different media on the site uh, constantly. Um, and, and that's another thing. I had been at the mine for several years and formed a great little relationship with with local media. So you know they were responding to us. They were getting factual information out. There was the one uh, media company or the media uh, stream that had been negative to us um, that was on site. But overall, I mean, we had a really good relationship with, with media in town. So they trusted the information we were providing. And then I just had one follow-up question with about the uh, the increased um, engagement and followership you've had on your social media during these couple of days. But um, how, what was there any sort of correlation between your social media traffic increasing with your website traffic increasing? Were more people going to the social media vice instead of the website, or vice versa? Do you, do you happen to know that? Uh, website didn't really uh, have much of an impact. We did look at the analytics, and there was a, there was an uptick in traffic to the website, but it was primarily all uh, Facebook that people were going to. So that even, that could really back the um, the notion that when people want information, the more uh, they tend to go to the social media networks first rather than the website. It was, and you know, even the local media, uh, whether it was on um, TV, print, whatever, uh, they would say for the latest updates, you know, see the Eagle Mind Facebook page, and they were they were reposting and and um, referencing people to the site as well. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, did you have a crisis communications plan in place, and did it achieve what you expected? Would you have changed anything? We did have a plan in place. Um, again, it didn't have probably as many backups as it needed to. Um, there was a social media component in there, and basically all it had said at that time was that uh, the company, is, uh, the company media relations representative myself was to be the primary person for posting. Um, what we should have changed is built more um, redundancy in that. So since I was out of cell phone coverage, out of, out of coverage altogether, um, there should have been some kind of other backup in place. Um, and then uh, we didn't have it built in, but I did have another colleague at the time just tracking every single comment and every single post and, and everything going on in real time. So she could alert me. Um, I did have, I had very weak text signal, so she could tell me if I had to address anything um, properly. But the other thing um, I would do differently is really uh, dive in on the um, practice of the social media engagement during those drills that that most companies do. Uh, Mike asked, with your expertise on Samarco, have you any plans for the anniversary on November 5th? And I, I, I guess that question is be directed to me. And uh, Mike, you know, I, not, nothing really formal, and I, you know, other than maybe bringing it up, and um, it's posting some updates on what's happening with the cleanup and. The community down there, but nothing terribly formal. But really, the space, really, that's some Marco disaster that happened in Brazil. Really, for you know, really solidified the idea I had for Clear Creek Digital because I was seeing the online dialogue and the response specifically from industry, and I was, it, it just made me shake my head so much to where this is where my space is. This is where I want to be. Not only do I support my the mining industry, I my position is to play a part in that industry in a way that not only um, builds on builds the reputation of it of the industry globally, but also allow those companies to be the first source of information. 
when good is happening and when bad is happening. So uh, if I have any plans, really, I, I'm doing that plan right now. This is the spot I, I, I really want to be. I want to help companies uh, within the mining industry really communicate in the open marketplace where people are gathering their information, whether that's through social media or through online uh, video and graphics. Uh, I'm really helping transform uh, the way the mining organizations are out there. Um, there's an opportunity space there, and so that's really, really what I'm doing. I'm not saying the business isn't risky, and is if there's something to mourn, we should mourn. If there's something we should celebrate, we should also celebrate. But we need to communicate everything as best as possible. So I hope that answers answers your question, Mike. Um, are there any other questions out there? Looks like we have one coming in. All right, Dan, is there anything um, you really you, you wanted to touch base on before we uh, depart? Well, I guess just, yeah, actually one other thing. Um, one thing that I found useful before, and I still do today, is, is just keeping abreast of the dialogue that's going on out there, knowing what kind of conversations people are happening, so or what people are having. So I utilize you know, Google Alerts, Hootsuite, Meltwater, um, just to have a, a broad picture of, of what kind of dialogue's going on when we're not having a crisis, um, just so you know we're aware of the audiences out there and, and what's being said. So I think it's you know good to keep an eye on those networks, utilize those tools. Um, yeah, go from there. Let me so, ask you. Let me ask you this, Dan. We still got a little bit of time. If there was one tool or piece of software that you really utilize outside of social media, you know, the things that were integrated with your online communications, what was one piece of software that you really couldn't do your work without that really, really optimized your work? That's a great question. Um... It, it, I mean, I really used Hootsuite the most. Yeah. Outside of the social network, just so I could manage them and not have all my screens up, I could do everything from one easy platform. Um, that helped a lot. Uh, that would probably be my best, my best friend when, when dealing with all of this. Um, the other thing too, if, if anyone um, has done media training, whether internally or professionally, I think that helped a lot in these situations too because I learned how to um, address different mediums, radio, print, TV. Um, it helped me with, with tone, with clarity, you know, bridging from a negative comment or a negative situation to you know, a more positive situation. Um, so outside of, of the digital space, um, whether you can get um, professional media training or just, I, I have several resources that I'd be happy to share with documents and, and things to give people tips, but I think that's another key component because you're going to be under stress, you're going to be under pressure, and you have to have that practice and that level head to be able to communicate effectively. And it sounds you'll lack sleep. Yes. <laughs> um, so, uh, on the uh, Hootsuite, you know, I optimize and use Sprout Social uh, myself. Um, big fan of, uh, of what they very similar, very similar software, but different interfaces as well. Um, great. And uh, yeah, and uh, uh, some, uh, Devin wrote, I'd love to see those uh, media training documents. I tell you what, uh, I work with Dan to. Uh, uh, to retrieve some of that, if that's all right, Dan, and share with the group yeah. via email. Sure. Okay. Yeah, that sounds that sounds best. So we'll we'll work on that in the next week or two. Um, let's see. Any other questions that anybody else have? I think we got one coming in. Couple coming in. Well, uh, you are very much welcome. Thank you for joining us. And Dan, uh, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to uh, share your expertise. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for the questions. Thanks for having me. And again, I know it was really, really quick, but I'm um, happy to discuss any of this anytime with anyone. All right. Um, well, if you get the opportunity, you can visit us at clearcreekdigital.com. 
Um, uh, expect uh, to see some emails come through with the media training uh, information from Dan, so I'll definitely work with him on that. Um, in the meantime, uh, continue to do great work. If we can be a resource to you uh, during that time, please feel free to reach out. Um, you can always reach me, uh, Trevor, at clearcreekdigital.com, um, and you can also fo follow our blog. Uh, just a quick quick plug, uh, you can uh, follow me, follow us, facebook.com slash clearcreekdigital. Um, we're also on, uh, you can follow me on Instagram and Snapchat. Uh, I know a lot of people think, well, where's the place for Snapchat in the mining industry? And uh, I, I, I think we're moving along with that, and I'm pretty pretty excited to see uh, some growing interest in that realm as well. So uh, in the meantime, thanks so much for your support, and have yourself a great day.